<clears throat> Hello, people of the interwebs. My name is Awen, and today we are talking about living primal druidry. This is not a history lesson. I want to make that very clear. It is not a history lesson. This is not some kind of manual of how to reconstruct some idea of what we think the past is. We don't even have a good way to know. We have a very incomplete picture of the past of the Druids, so this is not that. I'm actually very, very against that, and I'm sure I will uh, kvetch about that before this talk is over. But I want to keep that to a minimum, and what I do want to... I'm just going to kill a mystery real quick. What I do want to do is talk about what makes a practice, what makes Druidry alive in 2023 for me, like I said, in SoCal. So two things. One, what is crucial to Druidry? Being very obsessed with the number three. Druidry is all about triads. Every basically iteration of an understanding of divinity we have is set up in triads, in groupings of the number three. So the second thing that you need to know about Druidry is that it is about relationships. It is about living in relationship with really all life. And of course, that isn't to say that you're going to have the world's closest relationship with every form of life on earth. That's ridiculous. I'm not saying that at all. What we're saying here is the premise is that all of us are in relationship to all life at all times in one form or another. We have relationships with our friends, our lovers, sure. We also have relationships with our landlords, our mayors, uh, the neighbor's dog that doesn't shut up at two in the morning. It's, you hear what I'm saying? There are relationships and connections that are obviously not all going to be close, but it is about cultivating those relationships with honor, with hospitality, and with inspiration. But what makes that idea more special than just being a conscientious human being trying to be mindful, being aware of everything else, which by the way, I am not miss be nice to everyone at all times. So that's not what I'm saying. What makes this special is that the relationships that we truly cultivate that in part make us Druids is cultivating relationships of devotion, divinity, and magic with one of the first of the big three, the kindreds. The kindreds are the gods, nature spirits, and ancestors. Many of you even if you are not druids, uh, most likely you are not, <laughs> most people are not. It's a pretty slept on practice and methodology. Um, what If you are a practitioner of any kind, odds are you already have a relationship with some, if not all, of those beings, of with the ancestors, nature spirits, and gods. I think that it's pretty self-explanatory what those are, though I do like to always say ancestors do not necessarily have to be physical ancestors of the blood of flesh of your literal bloodline your ancestors can be those that taught you along your path they can be your teachers they can be your chosen family they can be uh people who blaze the trail of the path that you're on before you today that you've possibly never even met so they can be ancestors of your craft ancestors of your paths whatever that might be whether that's magic whether uh it's the person that taught you knitting whether it's uh the lineage that you're coming down from in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, for example. Uh, so I like to remind people that this is magic we're talking about. We are not fundamentalists <laughs> and not everything is 100% literal. It's not all about the letter of the law. That is the opposite of the point. And I'm sure I will get into this more later, but that is part of the inspiration that I do draw from, from the past. I don't wish it to be thought that I'm simply pulling all of this out of my ass. I do believe that history plays a very, very important role in today, but I think that it should be a trampoline, not um, a restraint system, not a, a hospital where you just, you get sick of your Christian upbringing, you get sick of modern life and you go, okay, fuck it, I'm gonna go play pretend and play dress up in the past. Especially with Druidry, it's not even possible. Our idea, what we know about them, is an extremely incomplete picture that is largely written by what you could call uh, <laughs> rightfully, uh, the villain. Um, so much of what we know about the Druids are from Julius Caesar's accounts from the Gallic Wars, when he was <laughs> going out of his way, probably not his first move, but eventually to annihilate the Druidic way of life. So 
there are a lot of different dilemmas when it comes to looking at history and how to apply them, uh, how to apply the lessons of history today. So I do believe very strongly in what is a druidic tenet of scholarship, of wisdom, of knowledge, but not into kidding myself that we can remake the past, which is not even desirable, even if it were possible. Um, I don't believe in that. So <laughs> now that that's gotten a bit out of the way, what else? There are a few other, just a few other big threes. And uh, some of the first ones that I wanna bring up, apart from the kindreds, would be the three realms and the three cauldrons. This is not super out there shit that's super hard to understand just to put it rather bluntly. Um, all of this, and part of what I love so much about it, is that it is what we should call deceptively simple. When I say it's simple, it doesn't mean that it's not deep, that there aren't hidden troves there, there are. But when I talk about it, you don't need 20 years of occult research to understand what I'm saying. So when I say the kindreds are immediately tied to the realms, just hear me out for a second. The three realms are land, sea, and sky. So, using that kind of witch's mentality of not being overly literal that I just mentioned, what comes to mind for what land, sea, and sky could possibly be more than just, okay, ocean, uh, you know, airplanes flying through the sky, whatever. Feel it out in your body for a second, if you would. Land is the flesh. Land is our bodies. Sea is our bloods. <laughs> the blood in our veins. I'm adding S's to things. Oh, and sky is the wind that passes through our flesh, our vessels. It is breath, pneuma, air, that which animates life. So already there is an immediate connection between the kindreds, between the realms and us, us as human beings, us as witches, as, as, uh, us as druids, whatever you, uh, whatever you work with. And the three cauldrons are really what solidifies that mind, body, spirit, kindred, uh, I said a spirit already, connection. So the three cauldrons are basically the three energy centers that the Celts saw as being within the body, but I think if you work with them today, it's not a stretch to understand that they are not just in the body, but that they correlate to those realms, to the kindreds, um, to spirit itself as portals, as it were. So the three cauldrons are the cauldron of warming, which is right here. It is exactly what you think it is. It is the cauldron of fertility, creation, life. And I think I might have written down the Gaelic somewhere, but to be honest with you, I go out of my way to really not use too much Gaelic because I don't speak it. Um, I've had the pleasure of speaking to people that were fluent in it, to practitioners actually, but I'm not, and I would rather just tell you what something means. So anyways, this is the cauldron of warming and creation right here. Next you have the cauldron of vocation, the cauldron of the heart. I tend to feel this as the cauldron where you know what is true, the cauldron of knowing your fate, knowing what calls you. Because it's not just called the cauldron of the heart, it's called the cauldron of vocation, what you do. Lastly, we have the cauldron of the mind, the cauldron of knowing. These three are so huge uh, just for, if you want to step into something which is also crucial to Druidry, which is trance, it is traveling between the realms, between that land, sea, and sky in a much more deeper sense because you look at the ocean as being connected to the ancestors, as connected to that world of spirit, that realm of chaos and potential which nourishes and sustains all life as Ian Corrigan put in the Two Powers Meditation. So these are, again, deceptively simple. They are about as simple as I think the person who's engaging with them is ready to make them. And that is something that I love so much about this path. It is as simple as you want it to be. Uh, <laughs> for me, uh, that means not at all and completely at the same time. So anyways, let's keep going. I'm a rambler, as you will or have already noticed. Anywho, kindreds, we talked about this. 
Um, mm -mm -mm. So you're probably already putting a bit of this together, but I do want to add, because I wrote it down, that the gods relate to uh, the sky and the cauldron of the head, the cauldron of the mind, the cauldron of wisdom and vision. There are people that have broken this down into um, like little graphs. So if you want to look at it visually, I'll Google it, honestly, just Google it. Uh, but I'll try and uh, connect some links in the uh, little description to this. So I, I will try to move right along. So all of the realms, something that you should be getting from this is that they are both within us and without us. They are all around us and they are uh, contain airplanes which are interrupting my train of thought but if you've ever heard the earth my body chant around a fireside if you've ever been to a pagan ritual where people start singing earth my body water my blood air my breath and fire my spirit then you get the idea um people today can call those elementals i simply call the kindreds the powers that be because that's what the hell they are. You can attach uh, whatever you want to that. So anyways, we got into the cauldrons already. These are really, I will just iterate this, these are really the three focal points of energy and I work them as portals for different kinds of trance and journeying, but they can also be focused on, and yes, I am reading from this, in the everyday to cultivate honor, hospitality, and inspiration, which are really what I would condense as the focuses of druidry. I don't, I don't always love the word virtue or values, not because I don't believe in them, but because I think they can get too abstract. Um, I don't like it when there's any separation between action and what you're saying is your belief. It gets too theoretical, it gets very armchair, it gets very like keyboard warrior, where you can act like you're this whatever, you know, online or to other people, um, but you don't do any of it in real life. And that is something that I <laughs> will, uh, emphasize about this path is that it is very much about action. So when I say that the cauldrons are portals to more than just uh, the kindreds, that they are bridges of connection into embodying their wisdom and their lessons, uh, especially the wisdom of the cauldrons in everyday life, I mean in a very physical sense. And whatever my hair is being is acting up, we're gonna forget about it. So when I say that, I do not just mean uh, meditation and trance, so those are very important. I mean in the everyday sense that, for example, um, one of my biggest, most consistent devotional offerings for a few years now is I lift weights for my patron goddess. It is a direct offering to her. Um, I might not look it at the moment because it is a work in progress, but I do strength training and I'm trying to veer into bodybuilding at some point, need to find a trainer, um, as a devotional offering to deepen my relationship with her in a way that affects me and her at the same time. Because not even for example, just uh, more about that particular fact, my patron goddess is the Morrigan. She is a goddess of sovereignty. She is a goddess of battle and uh, you know, quite a bit, actually. Sovereignty, battle, sexuality, and magic. I often call her the mistress of magic because her style of battle is not picking up the axe or the blade itself, but in making you go so fucking crazy that you stop trying to do something as stupid as fight a goddess of warfare, <laughs> sex, magic, and sovereignty. So that is something that is both devotional to her and it keeps me in my body. It uh, light, it lights up all of those cauldrons that are within me of creation, of vocation, of knowing my fate, of knowing my life, knowing what's right for me, and of wisdom. Because to continue that metaphor for a bit, there are certain lessons that you only get from action. Any any fucking, go to the most ripped bodybuilder in the world, go to the strongest people ever, and you will see a certain sense of humility and self-awareness because there are some things that you cannot shortcut. Just like in magic, there is no person in the world that got a six pack overnight. There is no person in the world that got 22 inch biceps, even in a week or in a month. And we're not gonna talk about steroids right now, but I think you guys get what I'm saying. There is a certain lesson in having to start where you actually are, like with magic, 
and growing from there with a sense of sincerity and putting faith into practice. So that is just my example of an embodiment of cauldron workings in the day-to-day -day in real life outside of ritual. For you, it might not be strength training. It might be dance. It might be knitting. I really, I'm not here to tell you what it should or shouldn't be. Um, but I would invite you to look into your own life and see what that could be for you. So, uh, let me turn the page here. My last little comment I wrote was that all of this leads into actual lived action as cultivation. Um, cultivation of the divine and of capability as a sacred duty. So somewhere that I do also very much um, look to the past as a trampoline, as a point of connection, um, is in the fact that the, the, the Druids wore many hats. They had different phases of training to prepare them for this, but ultimately a Druid was there in, uh, in their community to fulfill many functions, many purposes. One of them is that sort of, you know, priestly role that I perhaps sometimes jump to think of them as where they're doing divination, they're leading ritual. Um, if some of you have an idea of what a historic Druid was, maybe it's that, you know, that Pliny description of an old man in a white robe kind of ceremonially, uh, cutting mistletoe from an oak tree or doing human sacrifice or whatever you think it is but a lot more went into it they were the ones who were mediating disputes between people in the community they were often the ones who were enforcing agreed upon laws and taboos so i look at that and i look at the lesson of the fact that the druids had so many different roles that they played at the same time i look at what was venerated in the lore, in the myths and legends where you see gods, uh, demigods, if you will, like Lu, who was literally allowed into the class of the gods, as it were, because he was a master of so many different skills. So there is this real um, veneration, and, uh, veneration of and respect for being multi-skilled, for capability as a sacred duty. So I, this is where it again ties into action for me because I don't think that it's respectable to simply have all these beliefs or virtues that you don't carry into your real life that you don't do fuck all about. That maybe you talk about courage or bravery or honor or whatever, but um, if someone fell down in your circle, you can't help pick them up. And don't get in my face. Don't start with me about me bullying people who are just like, if you literally are cannot do something physically, obviously... I'm not fucking, that's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is taking it upon ourselves to do what we can. People are kind of so quick to jump of, oh, uh, the second that someone likes to go to the gym, that that means they're telling everyone that they should be doing the exact same thing. That's bullshit. I don't believe that at all. That is not what I'm saying. Um, we all have different abilities and capabilities. So what I am saying is that if this is something you care about, um, if you do see capability as a sacred duty, then look at what you can do and focus on honing that. And mind you, I am very far from the strongest person in the world. But something that I will share is that, you know, in times in my life where there have been animals that were not doing well health wise, that, um, you know, their hips would give out, younger me, before I saw capability as a sacred duty, I wouldn't have been able to help them. I wouldn't have been able to pick them up, to do anything to assist. And now I might not be able to deadlift 500 pounds, but I can pick up a dog that fell down. I can pick up a kid that might've hurt themselves. You know, I can do something. I can bring chairs to the ritual site. I can bring tables, you know, I'm, I'm there to help. I'm there to do something. So I think part of this is taking it upon ourselves to ask, what am I bringing to this path? What am I bringing to those who would walk this path with me instead of just asking for everything to be done for me? Because we don't know very much about the Druids, but we do know that they sure as fuck were not showing up demanding favors. And that's where that devotional element comes in again. We can only do the magic that we can because we have those relationships of devotion and offering. It would be like, let's say... Um, for example, I had a very good friend uh, 
once years ago and I have fond memories with them but I've just let things fall out of touch I haven't spoken to them in years and years um I just haven't shown up for them at all and then one day things are all falling apart for me I lost my job my partner left me I'm feeling all hopeless and destitute and I start banging down their door asking them to not only comfort me but fix my life to just wave a magic wand and make all kinds of changes and just make me feel better that is how so many fucking people approach the gods that is how so many people approach the kindreds and even now this is a very generous metaphor where i'm saying at least you were friends at one point in the future so there's some kind of relationship there a lot of the time you didn't have any relationship to speak of you're just demanding shit um or treating them like a bank which they're i'm just gonna say that they're not this is also a moment where I want to say that sometimes uh, something I've heard over my years of practicing is some people believe that basically witchcraft is a skill and paganism, polytheism, whatever, that that's a religion. And to a degree, I would say, sure, that's true. But what I will say with Druidry, it is both. It is absolutely 100% both. It is both a skill and it is a religion. And ultimately, I think it is a methodology for engaging with the divine in a meaningful way so we don't do things <laughs> like just show up and demand shit without putting any work in so that is something that i do is look at myself and see okay what can i actually do that would mean something so not just for this reason but when i do need to call on the gods uh if i'm having a hard time or if even if i'm not even if i'm trying to just further along good things that are already in motion that I'm not just drawing from an empty well, you know? So <laughs> again, I think this is something that many people can kind of already understand. So where was I going with this? My goodness. So to touch back on that sort of idea of the spirit of something versus the exact letter of the law, I do want to talk about there uh, being a very real Druidic historical taboo against writing things down, against uh, writing down their ritual wisdom, against writing down their spells and their magic. And I find it very, very funny and just telling that even now, uh, this is just, this is truer than ever. There have been studies, if you look this up, I will try to find the link for it, where basically people think that we're a lot smarter and more knowledgeable than we are simply because we have access to Google. We associate our proximity to knowledge to the ability to find answers and almost instantly to actually having that knowledge ourselves and that is i think precisely what the druids were trying to avoid by having uh, a taboo against writing their wisdom down and I, i've gone back and forth on this over the years of studying I, i've had uh one of my conspiracy theories was that they did write things down but that the romans burnt it all and that the Romans probably just um, destroyed any of the evidence in their largely successful quest to annihilate them. And that's very possible. But it is known, if you look at what we know of the history, that many of the Druids were literate. They, uh, you know, exchanged literal trade goods and ideas with uh, the Greeks, with the Romans, and really could hold their own intellectually to the point that, you know, Caesar and some of the other historians around that time were saying like these people are kind of like us they have similar ideas to us they worship in a similar way so what i partially one of the things that i draw from that is especially in my own working groups and generally how i do ritual in general is i refuse to do it from a script i refuse to look at a piece of paper and think that is going to take me or anyone else to the kindreds or to the gods i would rather stumble over my words um i would rather feel like i'm perhaps pulling something out of my ass than use the written word as a crutch in a way that was literally forbidden <laughs> by the ancients and you know i'm as i've said i am not for just senselessly venerating things that the old ones did just because they did them uh but I do think that there is wisdom to it that we can look at, especially when we are so inundated with an excess of what people just call content, which is so fucking soulless. We are constantly inundated with videos like this 
and you know just captions that are just written to get people's fucking attention and to the point where when you actually do show up to a ritual in real life you can see people hesitating and you can see the anxiety and the nervousness and i'm not here to shit on that at all i think even taking the stuff to do something in real life and to you know get off the internet and <laughs> touch some grass and light some incense uh obviously that's a good step and i wish people would do more of that but i do think that we need to constantly challenge ourselves to actually do what we say we're doing and what i say i'm doing with druidry is they were mediators of both god and man and they didn't believe in letting pieces of paper get in the way of that so that your cauldrons could actually be lit so that when you do magic you are doing magic you're not just reciting you know like some fucking performance and, and this is where i do want to talk about uh i don't know where i wrote i don't care <laughs> that's, it. that's the idea the irony of me talking about this while i have things written down um something i want to talk about is the larp element of modern paganism and where i think I, where i'm sympathetic to it and where i think we need to knock the shit off so i think all of us know what i mean with this the larp element of like people showing up and again not talking shit but i'll just uh flesh myself out here so people showing up in basically DD costumes looking like it's renaissance fair um trying to speak a language that they don't actually speak um you know trying to play one-upsmanship with each other on historical facts that is its own thing uh being a his like studying history is important it you can de uh, <laughs> i'm stuttering over my words to say how much it can contribute to your practice to be able to have a strong grasp of history to draw from it is very important however it is not the same as doing magic it is not the same fucking skill so we need to understand like when we show up to ritual looking like a trend fair and yeah i'm sitting here in my freaking celtic uh, fusion uh cape vest which i am really enjoying um i'm also here in my uggs at the same time we need to understand i think why we're doing it and we're doing it because this is a society that is not conducive to actual spiritual religious experiences um, some people will say this is a Christian society. Some people will say it's an atheist society. I'll say it's definitely not a society that is set up for practicing polytheists to have uh, authentic experiences. And uh, it really doesn't need to be, you know, like it's a minority religion. It always has been. And I actually think it should be because it's not for everyone. But we do need to look at ourselves and see, okay, when we're bringing these elements of costume into play and this sense of like reenactment of trying to recreate the past which we cannot fucking do um i think we need to take what we are attempting to do and maybe do it in a more just effective way because i am uh, i am all for like dress up to ritual i've worn uh stuff i got at renfair to rituals several times and i will again because that's not quite the problem i think the problem is more just the attitude of I am trying so hard to recreate something that I'm not having an actual experience here and now. So this is part of why I call what I do primal druidry because I'm not trying to recreate shit, I'm trying to do it. Um, it's also why I call myself American Druid a lot of the time. And because people hate using their brains, I'm just gonna call it that because people love to jump to one extreme or another, uh, people will jump to thinking that that means uh, I'm some kind of like white supremacist or American nationalist and blah blah like whatever the fuck. The reason that I say American Druid is because I live here. I just fucking live here. Um, in my experience, it's actually out of a place of attempted deep respect because I've never set foot in Ireland. I have never been to the Isles. I would love to, but how in fuck can I claim some kind of authentic uh uninterrupted continuation of some tradition where i've never even been to the country let alone you know like been taught the old ways by some cool old lady in a cave like i i wish but that's not the facts of it the facts of it is i am from southern california i was born and raised in los angeles and i happen to you know feel deeply called to druidry and i've been engaging with it for several years now and that means a lot to me and it means more to me 
than trying to look, you know, that's what's so funny is like in this misguided attempt to look authentic, I think that just makes us look even more fake. So I think it's important to recognize uh, who we are and where we are and work with what we have here and now, like from that basic acknowledgement of reality. So that is why I call myself American Druid. I just fucking live here and it's what I'm doing. Um, where was I going with that? So I, I am, I really am sympathetic to people that are trying to create um, something that they don't have, right? Like where we don't, and I talk about this a lot, the Mircha Eliad uh, wrote about this, what he delineated as the sacred and the profane, the sacred being, uh, you know, where you can have catharsis, where you can have transformative experiences. It is an interruption from this sort of sterile, soulless, you know, just heartless, especially modern world where everything is the fucking same all the time. And that's what he calls the profane. It's not about like being bad and dirty and wrong. It's just like, it's every day. It's mundane is what it is. It's mundane. So I think people are onto the sort of right idea when they're dressing up and they're trying to get themselves into the headspace of the sacred. And absolutely part of how we do that um, is going to be a literal physical attire. It is going to be tools. Um, placebos, if they work, then you can't just write them off as fake. And I'm, I don't even want to get into like, I, I fully believe all of this is real, but I also believe in engaging with real life. So I think this is where we need to look at things like, um, you know, tools, chalices, vests, cool capes, stuff like that. They are just helpful to get us where we want to go, where we need to be. The point is not um, taking fucking selfies and like saying, see you in Valhalla brothers on fucking Facebook. Like that's, if you want to do that, go for it. Like there's, you know, there's worse things you could be doing with your life than being kind of brotarded. I'm just going to call it that. But if you're going to call yourself a practitioner, um, and if what you're going to be doing is an actual, you know, practice of magic, then again, I think it is incumbent on you to look at what is actually effective, what's working, and what can you use to further um, actual meaningful ritual. So just some food for thought, not trying to shit on anyone. <laughs> well, actually, that's a fucking lie. Um, this is what I mean to say is like, I'm, I'm not above, you know, shitting on things that I disagree with, but I really just more care about effectiveness. I'm sympathetic. Like I fully, like I had my time where um, I was a lot more into, for example, Asatru and you would like, I would always be like ruining the fuck out of my face and like dressing a certain way to go to rituals. And you just get to a point where it's like, this is more about basically being a history nerd in real life than it is about doing magic. So for me, I decided that I cared more about doing actual magic, which is supposed to do something like it is. <laughs> someone once asked uh, the great Damien Eccles, who I have a ton of respect for, do you think this is real or is it all in our heads? And he basically just said, yes, both. And I fully believe that as well. So when I talk about things being effective, it's because we are trying to actually do something here. And at best, ideally, we're doing more than trying. We are actually doing things. There are things that work and things that don't. So I am simply presenting food for thought. And on that train, I do not know if this is going to get me in trouble with any kind of sensors, but I do want to briefly bring up what I will call plant medicine of the fungal variety. It should be very obvious what I'm talking about. Um, I want to preface my comments on it just for the record by saying that for years, literally until last Samhain, um, I refused to touch anything. I refused to touch absolutely anything, um, not just before uh, ritual or for ritual purposes, but out of it, I would have kind of a drink sometimes at most but I definitely wasn't touching anything harder than that. I tried smoking weed a few times. It's really not my best friend. So anyways, it took me a very long time to even consider the possibility because I fully believed uh, this seems like cheating to me. I don't want to just like have some, I don't want to be experiencing something fake or see something that's just like a pretty light show and, you know, not do the actual work of learning how to do trance 
by myself as a practitioner of learning how to do journeying um, based on my own actual connection to the divine. And, you know, in hindsight, I think it's important to not use things as a crutch, to not rely on them in that way. But that brand of plant medicine specifically, I am not talking about any other kind of substance at all. I have no interest in them and I'm so I'm not going to speak on them. With the fungal friends, as it were, I'm going to keep it to this. I do not think that they're fake. I do not think that whatever you experience while taking them is fake in any way, shape or form. I think that my fears about them were legitimate for where I was, but it's a pretty ignorant sort of uh, assessment of what doing mushrooms actually is. So, and, and there are, for those who are interested in, you know, the precedent of it, we do have pretty good reason to believe that the Druids were absolutely tripping on shrooms back in the day. Um, <laughs> there's, there's some uh, thought that they were also doing some kind of DMT-like substance. I'm not Miss Psychonaut, like I'm really not here to like get into that whole thing. I do just wanna say that for me personally, it is at this point, like, I own, so Halloween is my birthday. Um, I did them for the first time on Samhain, uh, on that sort of, you know, like Halloween, pre-Halloween ritual. Now I'm all worried that YouTube's gonna fucking ban me for talking about shit. Anyway, um, and I will say that I do keep rules around it. I will not even consider it unless it's one of the eight high days because I still do not wish to use things as a crutch, but I think it can be a very powerful some people call it medicine, I will call it a bridge to the divine, so that if you do already have a practice of ritual and actual trance, and you choose to incorporate that and you engage with that as a practitioner, um, I think it can be and often is extremely powerful. So I will leave it at that. Do with it what you will. We'll see if I get taken off <laughs> YouTube for that too. Um, I really don't know what sets off the censors these days. So I think I just wrote, do what works as long as you keep your base skills strong. Um, so I think that I've kind of broken down what I consider the very, very basics. This is definitely not like some kind of in-depth uh, curriculum or crash course, but these are just kind of some of the ideas that are the starting point when you are looking into doing living druidry today. It is what I work with all the time. So I'll just reiterate the three kindreds, uh, that is the gods, nature, spirits, and ancestors. It is the three realms of land, sea, and sky, uh, flesh, blood, and breath. It is the three cauldrons that are the portals, the bridges of us and the divine, of the physical and uh, the realm of spirit, that sort of uninterrupted connection between all of that because we don't see them as separate. So the last thing that I will talk about uh, before I sort of cap this off is where I got my name from, which yes, I chose. And yes, I will stick with this one this time. The power of the Awen. The Awen is the inspiration. It is the fire in the head that uh, lives in the hearts of all witches and poets of all artists. And it's said about the Celtic other world, the Celtic realm of spirit, that you emerge either mad or a poet. And that is really what you are doing as a druid, is learning how to uh, navigate those realms, navigate uh, traveling to, with the other world without completely losing your shit. Because as uh, a really marvelous teacher out here in Los Angeles has talked about quite a bit, his name is Griffin Ked out of the Green Man store. Uh, something he says that I love is, um, you can't do magic when you're living under a bridge, basically. So if you can, you know, let's say you're legitimately hearing actual, you've uh, achieved psychic connections, you're talking to the spirits all the time. Great. Can you hold down a job? Like, can you do the actual things that you need to do to successfully witch out? Because if you can't hold down a job, if you have nowhere to live, um, you're just going to be witching out under a bridge. And there's, sorry, no point to that. That would be a goddamn shame. So to tie back into the Druids wearing many hats um, and capability as a sacred duty, it is about being able to live on both sides of that veil, on both sides of that hedge, as it were. And so when we talk about the Awen, 
this is <laughs> magic at its most raw and concentrated. I don't know if I want to say primal because to me that always has a more like like sexy <laughs> baby making energy to it. Um, but the all one I tend to see as this blue flame, it is talked about as that fire in the head and it is that inspiration that you, you know, that drives you to do ritual, that drives you to do magic. And when we talk about land, sea, and sky, there is the last element of flame that unites the realms, that brings them together, that brings us uh, between the gods and nature spirits and ancestors. So the Awen is really, uh, you could say that it breaks that little triad, it makes it four instead of three. Um, I'm not even gonna bother trying to go into that. You can figure it out for yourself. <laughs> um, but I wanted to leave that as sort of the last a uh, little tidbit of food for thought, um, something that we value so very much. So that makes those uh, values, again, those focal points, honor, hospitality, and inspiration. So hospitality, it is such a deceptively simple and really extremely deep topic that I'm actually just gonna do another video on it because I kind of tried to get into it a little bit in this in my version of this talk at the pagan community retreat and it's really hard to just do as a throwaway i tried to summarize it and i suppose i'll try to summarize it here as well but keep an eye out for another video on that in the future if you are so inclined but basically hospitality when i spoke about being in a relationship to all life at all times that's what hospitality actually is Druid hospitality, pagan hospitality, it is a very different thing than just like using your table manners or like being nice when you're at someone's house. That's kind of part of the idea, but it is about obligation. It is about the relationship of honoring where you are and who you're with and what you are doing. So <laughs> maybe I, I'm not sure how much I can summarize this after all, but in essence, um, when we talk about cultivating our relationships with people and spirit and all things in as honorable a way as we can, that is really what hospitality is, is doing what is actually right and our action being right and in right alignment. So I think I will just leave that to another video after all, but I would challenge you if you did uh, make it this way, all this far, <laughs> I'm losing my words, into the video. What do you know about Druidry now? What did you know about it before? What do you feel you know about it now? If the answer is still absolutely nothing, then that will sadden me to hear, but I would challenge you to just go outside, uh, like I'm sitting right here, go find your nearest oak tree if possible, go sit yourself under it and go ask for yourself. Because really at the end of the day, one of the many beauties of this path that I love so fucking much is that no one can tell you you're a druid at the end of the day. No one can really tell you how to do it. We can break down, you know, what the building blocks are, what the foundations are, the kindreds, the realms, the cauldrons, but all of that is so that you go outside yourself so that you travel those realms for yourself and you mediate between you and spirit. Because that's why I'm here. That's, <laughs> that's why I started doing what I'm doing is because I remember being just endlessly frustrated um, that anyone would try to get in between me and God when I was younger because I was raised quite um, my father is a fundamentalist Christian uh, my mother is basically the Jewish equivalent of a fundamentalist she is full-blooded Persian and very intense about it um, understandably so perhaps a topic for another time but that was what irritated me the most about both of those religious experiences is just feeling that someone was constantly telling me that they were getting in my way that they were you know the idea that you can't uh play music when you're at church or temple the idea that you can't uh, that it's not active participation so this is really i'm just gonna go out on a limb on a crazy crazy limb and say that this is not a path for the passive it's really not you can absolutely you don't have to be you know a priest or a witch uh, to be pagan. You can just believe in your gods and give offerings to them and try to do right by them and basically just be religious in a polytheistic way. But to be a druid is really to be 
a priest. It is to at least try your damnedest to be a priest in this life. And that is not being passive in the slightest bit. It is a massive fucking challenge and responsibility and honor at the end of the day. So should you wish to know more about it? Um, I mean, I'm going to make another video on hospitality. I would recommend looking into Ian Corrigan's work. Luke Eastwood uh, has a great book called The Druid's Primer that breaks down just a lot of ingredients that you can use to do stuff in your own life. So those are my two top recommendations as always. Um, I suppose, okay, I'll, I'll add a little of this at the end as well. The biggest druidic organizations that uh, are sort of at work today would be Arnriot Fane, um, ADF, which is the group that I am involved in. I have been since I was 17. Um, they seem to be the biggest, at least on the West Coast, if not all of America. Uh, there's also the Order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids. They just don't meet up as much around at least my area from what I've seen. And those are really the two biggest groups that um, I've observed. Uh, there's some other ones like uh, freaking, what is it, Reformed Druids of North America. There, there's, a, there's a few other ones that honestly just, I'm sorry, don't seem to be frightfully active off the internet, unfortunately. Um, so if you don't if you are looking for more uh, basically writing or stuff to dig into and go on a rabbit hole about, then that's generally where I would recommend starting. But like I was saying before, I distracted myself because that's how ADHD works. Um, go outside and sit under a tree for yourself and start there because um, that's really what you're here to do. So I'm going to take my Uggs and I'm going to go home before the sun starts coming down again. But yeah, if you want to tell me what you feel you learned or what you know now about Druidry, what you have uh, done with any of your food for thought, I would be happy to hear it in the comments. Um, <laughs> and that's that. So thank you guys. And yeah.